I don't think about our body as like it's failing or fighting against us. I think about it as like, oh, it's trying to solve a problem. What is the problem that it's trying to solve? Madsen had a good question about what we were talking about before, asked about how does Evabradine play in? So this is kind of like the sequela of using medications where you're, you're kind of like a little of this and a little of that. I poured too much salt in. Let me put a little more stock in, right? Oh, now I don't have enough chicken. So I throw too much chicken in. Ah, crud. So now I got to put more stock in. And then you just like, Next thing you know, you got a pot of, of soup that's this big. Um, so how does Evabradine play? And Evabradine's role is this funny channel blocker. It, it basically increases the contractility of the heart. So it's mostly used in, well, it was designed to be used in, well, is most applicable in cases of heart failure where the contractility of the heart, like if, so in heart failure, you just like, when you go to activate the heart, it just doesn't have a lot of muscle left to, to really rock out. So Evabradine is basically just like juicing that system so we can get as much contractility out of the heart as possible. Um, interesting thing to think about then is then, well, we're taking a healthy cart that's already working real hard because it's beating real fast. And then we're just gonna say, let's crank it even more and we'll just beat it harder. Um, so that's fun. So it allows the heart to fill a little bit more and get a little bit more of an injection fraction, which can increase cardiac output, which is why some people uh, report benefit. But then you, you got to look at like what you're trading in for that, uh, which you, know, you got to make a decision on. So that kind of brings us to the next one, which is from Double H here that says that's what happens when you treat symptoms, not the cause. Poor guy was pushed to try to keep reducing the blood pressure, which is important, but it's hurting somewhere else. And I think that's like the moral of the story with a lot of these things is you're you're giving and taking because I think about these problems a little bit differently and it may be useful to you, it may not. But I don't think about our body as like it's failing or fighting against us. I think about it as like, oh, it's trying to solve a problem. What is the problem that it's trying to solve? Now, maybe that problem is causing symptoms in another area, but those symptoms are designed to like indicate to us that something is wrong, right? If it was if it was evolutionarily ineffective to have sense, feelings of negativity or feelings of symptoms, we wouldn't have them because it costs energy to have them. But they give us a way to understand that something is wrong. And so to assume that our body is just like, you know, thumbing its nose at us and saying, forget you, I'm going to do something different is I, I just don't abide to that. I think more realistically, your body's trying to compensate in whatever way it can that gives the best outcome given the current scenario. So going back to our case from before, cerebral perfusion pressure is low. You don't want to pass out and you want to be able to think, what can we do? Let's try to create more blood pressure and hold this person upright. Yeah. And that's the problem it's solving for. Now, on the downside, you're probably going to get out of breath because your heart's beating real fast like you're exercising. It might cause some problems because the blood pressure's high, but also it's saving you from falling over or having to live your life laying down in bed. So, like, that's a trade-off. Rather than trying to solve for the blood pressure problem, maybe we try to solve for how can we train them to be able to not have to work so hard and get more blood flow in their brain. That seems reasonable to me. So, of Aberdeen, we're just kind of like, juicing that system saying we're going to increase the cardiac output um, without really considering why the output is low uh, to begin with. So Nicholas Lyman up next, he says, hey doc, exclamation point. I think I said it right. Hey doc, could you explain why POTS creates a sensation of the neck getting tense or difficulty with breathing? So this can happen from a lot of different ways. So um, where to start? Let's, let's talk about in terms of the tenseness related to the difficulty with breathing. A couple different ways to think about it. Number one is just simple mechanical stuff. That's less common where all of it, like, because that doesn't kind of happen out of nowhere. Those are things that build up over time. But a lot of people will know that as that starts to, so like in a flare or if we're in a pot situation and we have some type of an input, you can think about this as just a bandwidth problem. So some people will notice that when they're driving, walking through their grocery store, thinking too much, they're in a weird posture, they might notice that the breathing starts to get tough and they start to feel tension in their neck. If that's true, then we've kind of exceeded bandwidth 
and we started to get a dysrhythmia with the breathing rate. And, and a lot of people will feel this. They might also feel like they get a lump in their throat. They might feel like they can't get a full breath. They might feel like the ribs are tight. Um, so there's, there's a lot of commonality there that is relative to just simple like overstimulation, not enough, not enough bandwidth to tolerate it. So those are tricky for people because they can feel like, I don't know what causes it. It can be anything, but it's just like an exceeding of bandwidth. So that's kind of one. So if we're trying to think of how do you reduce that in the moment, the simplest thing, and this is a very, very general strategy is just to literally cut bandwidth. So laying down, covering your eyes, taking some breaths, trying to let that work its way out. That's like the things you can do at home. Somebody here had an experience today where we could look at that same as a GI related thing, but with breathing, whereby giving different stimulus into the system, you can let it get some feedback and kind of recalibrate that breathing rate again so that the rate that's happening in your brain starts to match what should be happening in your diaphragm, matches what should be happening in the accessory muscles in the neck, and then you can kind of resort everything. So that's a, like the simplest way to think about it. People that, um, that we get a chance to look at, we can usually observe some things that can change a little bit faster, but it, it tends to be more specific to whatever they're going through. But recovery position is like my general kind of lame answer. You know, laying down, covering up your eyes, trying to breathe slow through your nose, putting your legs up on the wall, and just letting everything kind of calm down again. Sometimes that's the best way, um, but it doesn't work for everyone. A lot of times we can find more more successful things to do, but it's hard to know without without looking a little deeper.